Once again, I am Daniel McCarthy, the Vice President for the Collegiate Network at ISI and the editor of its journal, Modern Age. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome a panel of uh, prestigious economic thinkers uh, this afternoon as we talk about immigration and wages. Now, individually, either one of those questions would be controversial enough, but when you put them together, you have a great deal of conflict over perceptions as well as theories. Uh, certainly among uh, working class Americans, there is a kind of conventional wisdom that more immigration necessarily means lowering the wages of workers. Now in this town, and among professional economists, there's often a, a conventional wisdom that is in the opposite direction, which says that immigration at any level, and in fact as much as you can get of it, will only be beneficial ultimately for everyone by sort of uh, being the rising tide that lifts all boats. Now we have uh, with us today two brilliant thinkers who have uh, a, a good many uh, differences of perspective and ideas about both immigration and wages. You'll be hearing first from Stephen Moore, who is an author and economics columnist who has served as the senior economics writer for the Wall Street Journal editorial board. He is the founder and the past president of the Club for Growth, and he served as an advisor of the 2016 Donald Trump presidential campaign. He is a nationally syndicated columnist, and his work has frequently appeared not only in the Wall Street Journal, but in many other outlets, such as Fox News and CNN.com. After Stephen Moore, you'll be hearing from Oren Cass, who is the executive director of American Compass, and is the author of The Once and Future Worker, A Vision for the Renewal of Work in America. He is a contributing writer for the Financial Times, and his work appears regularly in such publications as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Moore. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to speak at this important conference. Um, I'm a big fan of ISI. They do amazing work, so it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to just give a very quick kind of panoramic view of what I, the, the impact that I think that immigration can have on the American economy, and I look forward to seeing what Warren has to say, and then, um, you know, your questions. So let me start by saying that one of my major... Um, points of emphasis with respect to the work I'm doing now is how do, we, how do we grow this economy? How do we make sure that we have a much faster growing economy than we've had in the past? If you look at the period from 1950 post-World War II through around um, the year 2000, we, the U.S. economy grew at an annual rate in real terms of about three to three and a half percent. And so you saw big increases in living standards. That Growth rate has slowed down in the last uh, 20 years, and now the growth rate uh, over the last two decades has slowed to 2%, and right now all the forecasts for the next uh, 20 to 25 years show the economy growing at about 1.7%. That's sort of the official government forecast. Uh, and I'm here to tell you we can't do that. We have to grow a lot faster than 1.7% if we're going to grow the economy so that we have the standard of living that all the young people in this room want to see. And also we're going to need a lot faster economic growth because we have, to, we have this enormous debt. And the only way we can bring this debt down um, is to grow the economy faster. Growth is everything. So, um, so how do you grow the economy? And there are a lot of different ways you do that uh, in terms of making sure that we have the capital investment and so on that will lead to more productivity. Uh, but one of the key features is you got to have a faster growing labor force. And one of the most important things that's happening in the world right now, especially the developed countries of the world, that nobody is really paying attention to is the population implosion. And this is something, it's, it's sort of ironic that we're talking about this in the year 20, 2023. When I got started in this business uh, 40 years ago, the left was talking about a population bomb and that we were going to see massive increases in population. We're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of energy because we're all going to breed like Norwegian field mice and the world was going to be, we we're going to live a Malthusian kind of subsistence level existence. Um, the population bomb um, never happened. It was always a, a ruse. And in fact, right now, you have exactly the opposite problem. So if you look at, in fact, I was just looking up these numbers the other day. If you look at, for example, the big Asian countries like China, Korea, Hong Kong, um, Singapore, uh, these countries have incredibly low birth rates. I mean, birth rates that are so low right now, they're unprecedented in world history. 
at least in modern world history. Uh, the birth rate, there was a statistic I saw that I forgot to mention Japan. They have a huge, huge demographic problem. Countries can't grow with, well, they can grow, but it's really hard to grow your economy with a falling population. There's no question about it. History shows this time and time again. And so you have, for example, in China, Japan, the, they were saying that 40%, this was in The Economist magazine, 40% of the women of child uh, you know, rearing age, um, childbearing age, are not going to have a, uh, any kids. And so you have these really, really low birth rates that are going to cause huge, huge demographic problems. Even China, by the way, which you know, once had uh, you know, uh, a huge population problem, they had their absurd, insane one-child policy, one of the greatest human rights violations in the history of the world. That was actually encouraged by the U.S. State Department, by the way. Uh, and now China has an inverted pyramid curve, so they have an aging population. So that's true of Europe as well. And the United States actually has a bit of a population uh, problem as well. We're below um, replacement level fertility, which means our population will decline. Except that the United States has the most important demographic safety valve of any country in the world. And we have, the, I believe that immigration is America's single greatest comparative advantage right now in the world economy. That is to say that we we can import the best and the brightest from all over the world. And by the way, we've been doing this for 200 years. So it's a formula that's worked really, really well for the United States. Um, and so if you look, by the way, at, um, well, let me give you an analogy for those of you who follow sports. Let's say that you were the owner of the Boston Celtics, right? And you wanted to build the best team. Well, one of the ways you, and imagine that you, as the owner of the Boston Celtics, we were able to get every single first round draft pick every year. Every single one of them. You would have a dominant team. You would dominate every year for the next 30 years. And I like that in this analogy in the United States. We can actually import the absolute best, brightest, smartest people in the world. And we do that. But we're not, we don't have an immigration pro, uh, situation that is a system that is really oriented towards trying to get the best and the brightest. And by the way, oftentimes you never know who those people will be. I mean, you have people uh, like the founder, Andrew Grove, who was the founder of Intel, who came in from Hungary with only the, sh literally, only the shirt on his back and, and was the builder and inventor of one of the greatest companies ever uh, founded. And that's, that's the immigration story, that immigrants generally do very well in the United States. Um, if you look at the statistics, for example, immigrants have very high uh, levels of um, work participation rate, both the men and women who immigrate to this country. There are huge advantages of immigration to the extent that um, the age profile of immigration is really, really beneficial for a country. So most immigrants come into the United States between the ages of about 16 and 35. So especially when they come in, you know, in their early 20s, that means all of their education was paid for by somebody else. It was paid for by some other country. It was like, so immigration is like a gift from the rest of the world to the United States. It's like reverse foreign aid that we get these hardworking, incredibly productive people. There was an old saying about immigrants, and this is about, you know, I think it was like 150, 100 to 150 years ago. I think it was maybe at the time of the great Ellis Island immigrants, which, which was, it went something like this. I may not quote it, quoting exactly. But it was that the um, cowardly stayed home and the weak died on the way. And so you have this kind of amazing self-selection process. And by the way, that's still true today. I mean, if you, even if you look at these migrants who are coming uh, you know, to the border right now, uh, look, I believe in a secure border. I'm a Trump guy. I do think we need to have a secure border as a nation. We can't just have anybody come into the country. But when you think about it, just those people who migrate to the border, those people have a lot of gumption, you know, to, to bring their kids, carry them on the back, go through. I see these, uh, these images of these women. You know, your heart bleeds for these people. They're literally, you know, tr crossing the Rio Grande, holding their children above their head. I mean, those are heroic people, whether, you know, that's not the right way to enter the country. But my point is that I'm trying to drive at is we need more immigrants. We have a way to, we should probably double the number of immigrants we're taking every year. Right now, the legal immigration numbers are roughly one million a year. I would say it would be advantageous for the United States to double that number. Um, and I'll just say one thing and then turn it over, one last thing, and I'll turn it over to Orrin. 
I think we should clearly have a skill-based system, a point system, so that people with high levels of skills, people with high levels of education, people who have some kind of um, uh, a special gift and talent, those people should be put first in line. I believe in a kind of America first. We want the immigrants who are going to contribute the most. But I don't think I would exclude people that you know are just ordinary, everyday Americans that, that, that want to share our, our values, want to work hard and, and, uh, and make a bit better living for themselves. You know, we used to worry that you know, immigrants would bring their own culture and they wouldn't Americanize. But when I look at our culture today, sometimes I wonder whether it's a good thing if these immigrants adopt some of the features of our culture. Um, and so we have this advantage. We should, take adva we should make sure that we're getting the immigrants we want. We should make sure we're not bringing in criminals or people with diseases or people with, um, you know, that are drug runners or, or people that can't take care of themselves. You know, there was always a policy from the Ellis Island days that when, you know, when those immigrants came into Ellis Island, you had to prove that you, were, you could be economically self-sufficient. You could take care of yourself. We turned a lot of people away if they were unhealthy or they were infirm or for one reason they couldn't contribute. So if we do this, I think we will see great advantages um, that will be um, enormous. And um, I guess the final way I put it is that by accepting more immigrants, not only do we do, we good, do good, but we also will do well. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much to ISI for <clears throat> convening this. Thank you to Steve. I, I always enjoy the chance to have these discussions with him. I, I guess as a preliminary matter, I would just say, did you say the word wages? I never, <laughs> I never brought up wages. No, we didn't bring up wages. That, that, well, it seems like a flaw in an argument on immigration and wages to not mention the word wages. And I think it's actually a quite telling flaw and goes to the heart of what the conservative, or frankly not so much conservatives as libertarian view on immigration policy has been, which is the focus is on aggregate economic growth, total level of GDP, and not on the actual outcome and, and the effect on the typical worker or the typical family. So we could double the number of people in America. Let's assume those people look <clears throat> roughly like the people already here in terms of their economic capacity. And we would double GDP. But that wouldn't necessarily do anything for the economic well-being of those who are already here. And so what we care about when we're thinking about immigration policy and its effect on the economy and its effect on the American people is not GDP growth. It's GDP growth per capita. And more specifically, it's wage growth at the median or even below. It's what does this mean for the earnings of the typical worker. I should give you credit. You didn't say wages. You did say standard of living. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to emphasize that aggregate GDP growth doesn't tell you anything about standard of living. Where does actual increased standard of living for a worker and a family come from? Well, it either comes from larger transfer payments, or it comes from that worker's ability to earn a higher wage. So for me, that's the question. What immigration policy is going to most positively influence the ability of the typical worker to earn a higher wage. And I think there, at least in the long run, productivity is absolutely what matters. How do we ensure that the productivity of American workers is growing? And as Steve said, that is tied closely to how do we ensure the capital investment that businesses are making is tied to the types of investments that are going to produce that kind of growth. So if that's the question, I guess I, I would illustrate it uh, actually, by, by stepping back, I wanted to tell a story about, uh, about a businessman. He's in the, the San Joaquin Valley in, in California, one of the major producers, uh, agricultural producing regions. Uh, and he was telling me, and obviously we see this in the news a lot, you know, he has a very hard time finding workers. Where do you find somebody who will take a job working in a hot field? long hours for $15 an hour. He said, this is a job Americans won't do. Now, the interesting thing about Alex is that he runs an app development company. He is looking for software programmers to sit on crates in the dusty field for $15 an hour. He cannot find any. And I think everyone in this room would recognize quite quickly that the problem here is with Alex. He appears to be a moron. 
And the idea that he is going to find software programmers to work at $15 an hour on dusty crates is, is, a, is a quite bad one. The question for us is, why do we think differently about Alex than we do about his neighbor, Bernie, who's a farmer? Bernie also wants to get people to work in a hot field all day for $15 an hour. But he's looking for agricultural workers. And when he says he has jobs Americans won't do, we, see, we, we for some reason take that a lot more seriously. For some reason we think, well, there's no, either there's no reason Americans should do those jobs, or there's something about the nature of farm work. And as a result, we should have sympathy for Bernie and find migrant workers to take those jobs. But we should tell Alex to get his act together and offer developers $75 an hour with free lunch in a, in a San Francisco Googleplex type, type setup. But I don't know why that's true. I can think of cultural reasons we think that. But in economic terms, it seems to me a function of the way we have approached our labor market to take for granted that some workers and some types of work are good and some are not. Now, the short answer is we say, well, the, the software developer is much more productive, right? He is he's a productive worker and is therefore entitled to all of these things that productive workers are entitled to. I'm not sure that's the case. Alex's workers create addictive games for people to stare out all day. Bernie's workers pick the crops that feed the country. Which one is more productive? We, we can only answer that question if we go another step forward and look at the value of the things they're selling in the market. You can buy an awful lot of lettuce very cheaply. High quality app development looks a lot more expensive. And yet the only reason the lettuce in the supermarket is so cheap is because we bring in the migrant farm workers to pick it. Our assessment of how productive workers are in different sectors of the economy, it turns out is actually circular. And to a significant extent, it's driven by the labor market conditions that obtain and the effect that that has on the kinds of investments that businesses make. Because the truth is, there's no such thing as a job Americans won't do. If you create a job and no one will take it, I guess it's a, it's a job listing Americans won't do, but no one took the job. There is no job. The only way a job comes into being is when there is, in fact, a person who will accept it. And if we were to take a different approach and say, well, actually, no, businesses don't have some right to be provided with workers for the kinds of jobs they create, we would create a very interesting incentive. I might even go so far as to argue it is a supply side incentive for exactly the kind of capital investment that we want to see which is the kind of capital investment that is going to build the kinds of businesses that employ American workers in jobs American workers will take at higher levels of productivity and therefore better wages. And so when I think about what we want our immigration policy to do, it seems to me the core of it is actually particularly in those segments of the labor market that have struggled, that have seen almost no wage gains for decades now, in part, I would say, because of the very high volume of immigration, what we want to be doing is actually constraining employers. What we want to be doing is creating an incentive that says, if you want to expand your business, if you want to be successful, you are actually going to have to build the kind of business that creates jobs Americans will do. There's a classic example, and it's a fascinating Rorschach test in the immigration debate from the Bracero program, which was a, a massive program of migrant uh, Mexican farm laborers in the 1960s. They discontinued it, and economists have gone back and looked at, well, what happened to the economy? What happened to the farms? What happened to the wages? And what they find is actually employment fell. It didn't, you didn't hire a whole bunch of new Americans to do those jobs. But they also find that, for the most part, production didn't fall. Farmers automated. They mechanized. They found more productive ways to produce more output with fewer workers. So if all you cared about was the quantity of jobs, you would say, well, look at what a failure. They shut down a program. They didn't create any jobs. But that's not what we want. right? Going back to what we actually care about, we care about the producti productivity of the American workers who are here. 
And if it, what happened when farmers had access to less labor was that they invested in capital equipment to make much more productive the operations that they were still conducting, that's a massive victory. That's exactly the outcome that we want to see. <clears throat> and so in terms of what it means practically for immigration policy, generally speaking, I agree with Steve that we want the best and brightest to come. I agree that we should reform our immigration system uh, in ways that ensure that, that those folks are welcomed. I would disagree that what the volume of that looks like is, is anything like two million people a year. Uh, I, I think there's a real tension in saying we both don't know who these people will be and we're letting them in after they've already had all their education. I think to a first approximation, if we're speaking about folks who have already completed their education, we can quite well tell who they would be. And when it comes to those with quite low levels of education, those who would be competing in the low skill segments of the labor market, I think we need to recognize that flooding that segment of the market with enormous new volumes of workers, yes, it will increase absolute GDP, but it will discourage investment in productivity. It will cause exactly the sort of stagnation in wages that we've seen in recent decades. In construction industry, productivity has been declining for decades. Actually, now for the last decade in manufacturing, productivity has been declining. The idea that what we need to be doing is expanding the supply of labor makes sense if all you care about is GDP, makes no sense if what you care about is wages and the well-being of the American worker. And so absolutely yes to the best and the brightest. That's a kind of reform we should pursue. But let's be honest about what that is, how big that is. And let's also be honest that if our interest is purely GDP growth, then the two million plan makes sense. If our concern is actually the wages and productivity of the typical American worker, then far, far less immigration at the low end of the labor market has to be an imperative. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So I have plenty of questions uh, for both of you, but uh, each of you has laid out a quite distinct uh, view of immigration as a whole, and perhaps uh, at least implicitly the relationship between immigration and wages. So maybe the first thing we should do is to kind of solicit your responses or reactions to one another's remarks. Uh, Steve, what do you think of what you've just heard from Oren? So actually, I don't disagree with much of what Oren said, I completely agree that, that you win the game by being the most productive society, no question about that. We want the American worker to be the most productive in the world, and the good news is that American workers on balance are the most productive in the world. That's the way we've become the richest country in the world. Um, and so uh, that's really important, and I don't, I don't see why letting in more immigrants to the country, especially skilled immigrants, but look, I'm in favor of, if somebody wants to come into this country and work, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just don't want people coming in and, and you know, going on welfare benefits. One of my, if I were doing immigration policy, I would, uh, I would basically um, have a policy that would basically say, so for the first 10 years in the United States, you're not eligible for wel welfare, blah, blah. You want to come to this country? Immigration, yes, but welfare, no. Now, I don't know if that's a practical thing. I don't know if uh, Democrats would allow that to be. But I guarantee if you told people in the world, you can come to this country, but you can't get food stamps and blah, 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 they, there's no shortage of people who'd want to come to the country under that condition. Um, immigrants don't just take jobs. Of course, they take jobs. They c come here to work. By the way, immigrants have a really high um, you know, propensity to work, much higher than the United States, which I, citizens, people are born here. So that's a good thing, in my opinion, not a bad thing. But immigrants also tend to have very high um, um, entrepreneurial rates. So they start businesses at a much higher rate than the United, than, you know, the average American-born person. And that's partly because I think of the, see, the thing that I think is really special about immigrants is this self-selection process. That it's not like you're just taking a random you know, two million people from the rest of the world. The people who are coming here, as I was saying earlier, they are kind of self-selected on the basis of, of their ambition and their gumption and their hard work and so on. And so those are positive things. But immigrants do have high rates of, of creating businesses. And when you create a business, you create jobs. Um, I'd make one other quick point and then turn it over to Oren, which is, you know, if you look at what groups are successful in America, if you look at... Um, for example, median household income in the United States. Census Bureau comes out with this data every year. 
um, I, it annoys me to no end when, when um, you know, Joe Biden says we're a systemically racist country. The United States is not a systemically racist country. We're, we are truly the first successful multi multicultural country probably in the history of civilization, and we should be proud of that. Um, and so if you look, for example, at uh, the, do you know what, uh, do you know what um, ethnic group is by far the most successful in America? There are um, some uh, African uh, immigrant groups there that are, actually do very actually. well. There yes. are, it's, but and there are, Indians I think it's like well. Nigeria, I forget, yeah. I was looking at those numbers, but Asians are incredibly successful. Sure. So if you look at, in fact, people don't realize this, Asians have a, 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 a fairly significantly higher median income than, than white Americans do. Um, and most of them are either first generation or second generation immigrants. So they do really well in the United States. Now, how can brown skinned people do so well in the country if we're a systemically racist country? Um, and so my point is immigrants do well in the United States. And one last point, and then I'll turn it over to Oren. The other thing that's pretty consistent throughout history is immigrants do really well but you know, the most successful generation is the children of immigrants. So if you're not gonna let in immigrants, then you're not gonna have the children of immigrants, and you're not gonna get that replenishment uh, of human talent that I think makes America a special place. I always say that the reason, look, I think the biggest issue for our country in the next 30 years is will China or the United States be the world economic superpower? And, and the reason, I always say the reason I would bet on the United States is because our Chinese are smarter than their Chinese. And you know, that's kind of a joke, but it's actually true. We are getting people from all over the world that are quite successful. So Oren, you've uh, already responded to some of Steve's remarks uh, in your own uh, comments from the podium. Are there additional thoughts you have based on what Steve has just said? Yeah, I would pick up on, on those comments because I think the, you know, one thing Stephen said, again, we, we completely agree on is, is productivity is incredibly important here. That's something we have to be focused on. The problem in my mind is none of the other things that, that you then just described were about boosting productivity. I have, I have no doubt that immigration is, is highly positive for the immigrants. No, no doubt about that. Um, for certainly significant segments, they are very successful in the United States. No question about that. The question here is, how does the flow of immigrants, and, and particularly into different parts of the labor market, affect business investment? I mean, this is, this is the quintessential supply side question here. If we are talking about business investment that is going to boost productivity, what kind of policy creates the incentives for more of the business investment that we want? And so I'd love to like really focus in on that and, and push a little bit. I, I do think it might be useful as a starting point though, because you know, the immigration debate has so many facets. Like maybe if we start with what should be the easiest one based on, on your comments, how do you feel about temporary worker programs? I mean, would you agree we should get rid of those? I'm generally in favor of them. You're in favor of them, yeah, even I though that they qualify in none of the ways you just described were good about well, immigration. I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I would say that you know when you have a temp temporary workers come in and do agriculture work in the United States, that benefits everyone. I don't. Who's who is hurt by that policy? The American workers who would potentially have higher productivity jobs in the sector if those workers weren't available. Well, we've made. I mean, again, I, I would push back on that. Our our agriculture industry is the is. You know, all we've seen is technological innovation in agriculture. You know, the far, average farmer today produces three times as much, uh, you know, agriculture with three times fewer, you know, with one third as many workers on one third as many acres. That's that's pretty high productivity. I, I agree that farms are are <clears throat> growing in their productivity, at least in some some crops, certainly. But if what we're talking about is the set of policies and incentives that are going to most promote investment in higher productivity, does providing essentially an unlimited supply of temporary foreign workers promote or discourage investment in capital investment in productivity? It seems to me it obviously discourages it. As a, I don't think that, you know, I don't see the record showing that. I, the United States has by far the most productive uh, farmers in the world, so I don't. I just don't see the evidence that supports that. The other thing I would say is, you know, I'm also a believer in rights, and 
question is, if, if an immigrant comes in and takes a job, is that, is that taking away a right of someone else who's already born here? I don't, it's not as if it's a zero-sum game where if the immigrant takes this job, then an American can't take that job. I mean, there are, there are you know, in, uh, huge numbers of jobs available. And you know, when bus immigrants start those businesses, they're creating jobs for Americans. No, I'm, I'm not saying that you have the immigrant taking the American job. What I'm saying is that over the last 50 years, the, the average wage for a non-supervisory you know, production or production worker grew by 1%. That, that, that's the you problem. You mean one percent per year? Or? No. Well, that's just that. Uh, that statistic isn't. I mean, the, if you look at average family income in the United States in real terms, according to the Census Bureau, in the last since 1980, the average family has a living standards is about fifty percent higher than it was in 1980. But you've gone. You see, again, we've left wages to the side and switched to household income. Yeah. I'm talking about the actual wage for a single worker. Yeah. And I'm well, talking specifically about production and non-supervisory workers. Well, don't forget, I mean, this is a whole separate debate, but it used to be workers were paid wages. Now they're paid wages, health benefits, vacation days, da 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 da, da all of these other things. So when you look at overall compensation, it tells a little bit of a different, a different story. It tells a little bit of a different story. I think this is actually a good <clears throat> illustration of, of the question of, of what kind of jobs we're creating because you know, so this survey research that we did at American Compass looking at what is the actual character of the jobs in the economy because we report the top line figure, 200,000 jobs created. We, we actually know surprisingly little in a lot of cases about the character of those jobs. And if you actually ask people in those jobs about the characteristics of them. And we do this with survey data. Scott Winship at AEI has actually done some very good work sort of validating it based on, on you know, aggregate government data. If you ask workers about the conditions of their jobs, what you find is, you know, so we define a secure job at a pretty low threshold, pays $40,000 a year, has health benefits, has predictability in scheduling and future earnings, has paid time off. So kind of those things mm -hmm. you, you just described. Less than half of uh, jobs in the American economy actually meet that criteria. For, for people without a college degree, it's less than a third. And so there are certainly mm -hmm. plenty of people with great jobs and Cadillac health plans and everything else. But it seems to me that one of the huge problems over the past few decades is that we've we've seen the economy evolve and grow in a way that creates a lot of jobs, but the jobs that it creates, frankly, in a lot of cases are not very good ones. And one way that happens and that works is because we are continually adding ever more workers into the pool. And one thing I think we've seen in recent years, including during the Trump economy, when the labor market was much tighter, that benefited workers. Having a, a less of a supply of other workers available to draw on was very beneficial to the workers who were here and had more bargaining power, saw higher gains in wages, and so forth. And so it seems to me that's the, that's the only mechanism by which workers are going to get a better deal over time. I, I can't think of any others. Well, look, we'll have a good experiment in the next 30 years about you know, whether or not you're right about that, because as I said, Virtually every Asian country in the world has a declining population now. So you're kind of making the argument that countries with declining populations, because they, you know, because they have fewer workers, bid up the wages. But I mean, I just don't see that. I mean, if you look at, for example, Silicon Valley, you know, which you talk a lot about productivity and technology, and we all agree that that, that is something that drives uh, higher wages and makes uh, workers more productive. Well. I'd make the case we wouldn't even have had a Silicon Valley if it hadn't been for immigrants. I mean, it, I've, I've visited Google and Microsoft and Apple and, and what's going on at these companies. It's changed a lot in the last few years because those workers aren't even working and the, they're now working at home for the most part. But, you know, I gave a speech, I don't know, five years ago at a Google facility, you know, and there were about 400 of the employees there, and you know, I I, uh, I felt like I was giving a talk to the United Nations. I mean, it was the most unbelievable thing. You had an Indian working, sitting you know next to a Mexican, working sitting next to somebody from El Salvador, and that kind of uh, you know brain power 
leads to more productivity and more investment. No, no disagreement. And, and <clears throat> frankly, this is one of my frustrations in the immigration debate, is that there's a very broad, I guess it's sort of a Mott and Bailey argument, there's a very broad claim made about immigration writ large. Let's have two million people, anybody who can come um, and, and sort of shows the gumption. And then when you say, well, what are we actually getting out of this? What are the benefits? We retreat to this sort of best and the brightest people founding companies in Silicon Valley. There's no debate about the best and the brightest, at, at least here, and I would say pretty broadly on the, on, in the American spectrum. The, the question is the, let's say, two million, the, the folks who are not bringing unique mm -hmm. skills, who are, you know, yeah. do not even have a college right. degree. And you're talking about, for example, the migrant workers who come in and work in agriculture or work on construction projects. Uh, right, and like that's that. right. And okay. so this is why I asked about the, yeah. the temporary workers. But even we're talking about yeah. permanent, if you, you know, through family unification and other ways. And, and certainly I took it under the, the proposals you were describing it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a, a massive, massive increase in the number of workers competing in those segments of the labor market that have not seen great outcomes in recent decades, that are, are not the people at your United Nations forum in Silicon Valley. And so my question is just, as we think about what are the conditions under which things will get better for them, that your, that your typical worker, let's say without a college degree, mm -hmm is going to see their productivity and wages and working conditions improve, it seems to me the only way that that happens is if there is a tight labor market. If there's what? A tight labor market. Yeah. Is that uh, but Do wage, you see but, other mechanisms, or is that Well, look, right. wages can't grow faster than productivity. It's just, you know, it's just a law of economics. So, well, they could. Labor could grow you know, Yeah, but that's just going to cause higher prices then, right? No, why can't labor have a higher share of output? Well, but then you're going to have less capital investment. And then you, we all agreed you need cap, capital investment for the growth. So wages can only grow as fast as, as you know, productivity. And to create a scarcity of workers, I don't think is, look, we can put people to work in this country. <laughs> there, are, there are jobs, especially now, I mean, there's just every, virtually every industry, even, even though I think the economy's slowing down, there are jobs available to people. Uh, you look, let me make another point because I, this is a really fascinating debate. You know, you can have a situation where the average wage in the United States goes down, but everybody is better off, right? So I'll just give you a very simple micro example. So we, my wife and I work, and we have two kids, and we have a woman from Ukraine who comes to our home and she takes care of our kids. And I, I don't even know what we pay her. Right? $20, $25, I don't, I don't actually know. My wife does the bills. But my point is, she's not a high-wage worker. She doesn't even speak very good English. She literally just came here from Ukraine a few months ago. Um, she's clearly better off, right? There's no question. She's a lot happier being here in the United States than being in Ukraine where there's a war going on. Uh, so she's better off, but she makes my wife and I more productive, right? Because now my wife and I can work and she can take care of our kids. So our... Um, you know, our income rises and our productivity rises, she's better off and nobody's worse off. It's a kind of Pareto optimal situation. I, there's no victim in that situation and you could tell that story a million times over. The other thing is, if you look at those immigrants who are in Silicon Valley working, I'm just using Silicon Valley as an example. We now have, you know, so many different tech sectors all across the country. A lot of them did not come into the country through you know, the gifted and talented program. We don't, it's hard to know who are gonna be the gifted and talented people. Um, and one other quick point, and I'd like your reaction to this. Um, I, I, you know, how does innovation happen? You know, because we, we want innovation. I think one of the reasons that virtually every, invention, every important invention over the last 200 years has come from the United States is that we are a melting pot. And we are a melting pot of people of different cultures that are bringing different kinds of ideas in to the scientific laboratory, and it fosters that kind of innovation that no other country has. What, I mean, why do you think it is, Oren, that the United States has been the driving force of new technology over the last 50 years? What do you think explains that? Well, I think there, I mean, I could give you a very long list. I agree that immigration is a part of it, mm -hmm. but again, we're doing the thing where you are, generally speaking, talking about people, especially if, as you said, people are immigrating here after their education is done, we're talking about people about whom we have a, a fairly good sense of 
whether or not they have at least the the potential mm -hmm. to provide right. that world beating innovation right. in a lab. There aren't a lot of uh, you know folks in their twenties and thirties who have only completed high school. That's true. Who it actually turns out are, are gonna, gonna be driving those innovations. And that, again, that is no criticism on them. Right. But when we are talking about the health of the US labor market, I think it, I think it is a huge mistake to take the, the narrow right. micro example of, of the nanny and say, well, because it worked out well for the nanny, there are no costs here. I, I would say two things. First of all, if well, who's, talk, who is harmed by right. that? So let me yeah. say two things. First of all, Let's say she's getting, it is just important to emphasize that 20 to $25 an hour mm -hmm. is already at or above the average wage in this country, okay? We have half of the jobs in this country below that. So when, when we're thinking about the scale, it's important to understand the actual structure of the labor market. And when you think in the aggregate level about the labor market, the supply of workers available is a major driver of the incentives for employers. And so this sort of, you know, let's flip and talk about the individual example instead of the actual macroeconomic forces is, you know, in my mind, something that, that we see a lot more often um, from, from the left in, in an effort to sort of personalize narratives instead of thinking yeah. about incentives, right? So I say, like, look at this person who mm -hmm. is, you know, homeless on the street. We could provide this support to that person that person is clearly better off. Mm -hmm. You know what, that person probably is better off. The incentives we create if we go around building that kind of mm -hmm. system are what concern us. And conservatives are generally much better at recognizing right. that. And so in this context, I have no doubt that the individual stories that you're telling appear to be win-wins for the individuals in those stories. Mm -hmm. I again come back to the question of, if we want the incentive to be for capital investment to be focused on creating better, higher productivity jobs, don't we need tight labor markets to do that? And I say uh, no. I think actually if you look, for example, at let's compare the United States with Europe because you're giving a kind of very downer picture of the United States and look, I, th I think that some things are clearly going wrong. And, and I could not agree with you more that we better be very focus like a laser beam about doing something about this dreadful education system we have in the United States. It is a total disgrace uh, that kids are graduating from high school and they can't read and they can't do math. And you're right, those, we're doing an, it's, it's, it's child abuse what's happening in our, in our government schools today. And so um, those kids don't have a chance. You know, those kids, if you're graduating somebody at 18 years old and they can't do arithmetic and they can't read very well, they're not going to make a lot of money. They're not going to be a productive citizen. So we better, we better do something about you know, dramatically improving the education system in this country. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you look at the, there was just an article in the, you probably saw it, I think it was in either in The Economist or The Wall Street Journal, that showed that um, back, I think it was around 1980, or maybe a little uh, later than that, Europe and the United States had roughly the same GDP. And now we're like 40% higher than they are. That's a pretty spectacular achievement. Now, Europe doesn't take you know, that many immigrants, but we do, so how is it that we sped so much faster ahead than they have? We just did the GDP instead of GDP per capita thing, right? That's exactly the outcome you would expect if we had added a lot of people <laughs> without respect to what happened to productivity. This, this is exactly the point. That, that, that statistic tells you nothing about what has happened with productivity. I, uh, this is, I, I, I found this very useful because I think we've come to sort of the crux of this agreement here where you said tight labor markets aren't actually necessary to driving better outcomes for workers. It, Right? I, I, is that your view? I mean, for I me, that really, strikes I, me as the... I'm kind of, I, you know, obviously under, not understanding the argument. Yes, obviously, we need workers to be a more, a richer No, no, society. tight labor markets, meaning low unemployment rate, high vacancies relative to available workers, employers feeling like there's a shortage. Sure, but just adding more workers, you know, my point is, when you add more immigrants, you don't just, immigrants create jobs, they don't just take them. 
right? Or else we'd be a better off society if everybody only had one child or something like that, because then you'd have fewer people entering the workforce. So I just think that's a, that argument is kind of a non sequitur. We need more workers, and we need more productive workers, and we need more innovation. And you're right, we need all, you know, capital investment. We need all of those things, and if we have all those things combined, we're going to be a very rich nation that, that really does become a tide that lifts all boats, in my opinion. We're a little short on time, but I want to... Um, <laughs> we forgot about you. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what we want. Yeah. We want to see this meeting of minds yeah. between, uh, or a conflict of minds, between uh, two brilliant intellects. Um, there are two points, actually, that I want to draw out, especially that relate immigration to wages, one of which um, has been already put out there by Oren, but I think perhaps we can focus it a little more tightly. So um, if we didn't have as much uh, temporary labor, immigration labor coming in for agricultural purposes, chances are in order to get the same degree of agricultural productivity, we would have to mechanize more. And that could be seen as being a uh, climb up the ladder of productivity because you're now you know, creating new machines. Mm -hmm. uh, the jobs that are necessary to build those machines are going to be higher wage jobs than the jobs of someone picking lettuces. Now, there are probably going to be fewer of those machine making jobs, mm -hmm. but they're going to be more productive and generally um, superior. Um, uh, so let me ask, you know, first of all, Oren, is that uh, the scenario you envision? And Steve, if so, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I, that's right. Um, so you're asking me the question about why we don't have more uh, mechanization? Well, no, I mean, so one of the, one of, and, and, you know, there's great economic research saying that one of the economic failures and, and uh, damages of slavery is that when you have uh, slave labor, which obviously you're not paying, uh, you have no incentive to innovate and to, to create new things because mm -hmm. instead of having everything automated, everything's being done by human labor that is uncompensated. Now, if you have low, co workers who are compensated at only a very low level, that's obviously morally infinitely better than slavery, but you also don't have the same degree of pressure to technologically innovate because you have this huge supply of cheap labor. If you didn't have that huge supply of cheap labor, wouldn't the pressure to innovate be much higher? Well, I guess that be I see your point. Yeah, yeah, and I'd say we've had both. We've had we've let in a lot of immigrants, so we've let uh, you know tens of millions of people into this country over the last hundred years. That uh, so no country has taken in more immigrants than we have, and yet we also have the most productive economy and we have the most innovative economy. So I don't see them as in competition with each other. I mean, it's a very interesting discussion actually because if we were having this debate, you know five to 10 years from now, robots are gonna be doing a lot of this work. I mean, you know, so you, are gonna, you could have robots, you know, my wife did grow up on a farm, and you know, she, they used to have to pick the fruits off of the trees and things like that. And, and so, you know, you're gonna have robots potentially doing a lot of this. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence robotics are gonna to totally change you know, even the kinds of things that we're talking about. That is productivity enhancing, but we're still gonna need workers. Well, I, I, so the robots is a great example. Like, hopefully we will have right. a lot more automation robotics. Over the last 15 years, we have not. For all the talk about robotics mm. and automation, and, and you alluded to this talking about growth generally, we are seeing a slowdown in productivity growth, right? If, if you actually think about <clears throat> the correlation between productivity and economic growth in this country and immigration policy in this country, it happens to be exactly in that window when we had very restrictive immigration policy in the post-war era when we saw the highest level of productivity and economic growth. Now, I don't think that's a direct one-to-one -one causation, but in fact, the exact set of problems we've been seeing as we have really allowed the expansion of the labor supply, particularly at the lower end, is that lack of, of incentive and, and necessity that Dan is describing to automate. I mean, if you look at robotics in American factories even, we are so far behind uh, the you know, leading edge companies or countries, many of which are in Asia. And so when you talk about robots in that context, whether it's on farms, whether it's in households, the, the exact formula for rising prosperity is if you can't find workers to do things cheaply, and so you have to make the capital investments. And those workers who are complements to the capital are therefore much more productive and can earn a much higher wage. If you have large numbers of low-skilled workers available at low wages, the pressure to, to, to develop those robots, to implement those robots, is much lower. 
And so as we think about what are the key incentives that are going to drive the kind of investment we want, if I were to say on the one hand, like, well, we could lower tax rates another three percentage points, or on the other hand, we could dramatically tighten our labor market at the low end, it seems to me that dramatically tighten our labor market at the low end is the obviously much more powerful supply side policy. And what frustrates me is that I think on certain segments of the right, well, maybe next time we try cutting tax rates by three points, that's the one that'll really suddenly get things going, is instead what we keep hearing. And it's just not working. Well, it certainly has worked since Reagan came in and cut tax rates because we've had the biggest productivity explosion. I mean, what's happened in the United States over the last 40 years has been the biggest wealth boom in the history of civilization. Not but, not, but not productivity boom. What? Producti not productivity boom. Productivity growth was higher before. Well, where, did the, where did all the wealth come from then? Well, you're talking about wealth or are you talking about income, first of well, all? Well, the Dow Jones was 1,000 you know, in 1982, and now it's at 33,000. You know, the, um, we but, have, but that's the, the, but the that's wealth the, of the United States, the total wealth of all the assets we have, are, are, have like tripled, in the, not tripled, quadrupled in the last 40 years. Now, you could argue, oh, well, it's, you know, too much of it is going to the top two or three or four percent. We could argue about how we could distribute that wealth better. But there's no question that in a period of, you know, when Reagan came in, we deregulated the economy, we cut tax rates. Reagan was pro-immigration. We had a lot of immigrants come into the United States, and boom, 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 boom. We've had, you know, the greatest period of, of advanced living <laughs> had, ever. Boom, boom, boom. We've had the stock market repeatedly surge as we made incredibly cheap labor available to corporations, well, generating so, corporate so cheap profits. Cheap labor leads to a booming stock market. That benefits everyone. Really? Yeah. Does, does, does that benefit the cheap labor? Well, <laughs> we, look, there's something in economics called reveal preference. If they didn't want to be here, they wouldn't be here, right? So by, by virtue of the fact that they're here, ask the immigrants. Show out, go out and <laughs> but, ask but the Steve, Uber driver who drove Steve, me here. Are you better off here than in, in you know, Segal or wh whatever country you, you came from? Steve, and they, they will say they're much better off. So there's no doubt that the immigrants themselves are better off. Right? I am not disputing okay. that. So My then concern, the question is, are American citizens better that off? That would be the question. And, and I believe that, that you know, it's pretty clear. That they, as in the same labor market that is the cheap labor, for the benefit of the higher corporate profits are also better off. I think that when you see the kind of innovation that we've had in this country, and you know, you and I have, have had this argument. I mean, it's easy how we can democratize the returns in the stock market, just let everybody put their money in the Social Security into, you know, a, a Buy America fund where every American is an owner. But yeah, we've seen huge advances. And even for middle class workers, the amount of money, you know, there's a big question now about where are people getting all this money that they're spending? Because what's driving the economy in the last 18 months has just been massive consumer spending. Well, what they're doing, what Americans are starting to do is spend out of that massive wealth that, that you know, we've created over the last 40 years. But you, you understand the, the median, the, the, the bottom 50% of households gain, gain no wealth. From, from, 19, from 1989 yeah. to the, the onset of the, the recession, the, the Federal Reserve data shows that the wealth of, certainly as you said, massive gains in total wealth, mm -hmm. but, but what is the actual asset base of your typical median householder below? It's up about 50% in real terms since 1980. That's a, that's a pretty gigantic gain in 40 years. And so they're, and they're now spending that down to keep the economy going? It's a, I think the economy is not nearly as good right now as Joe Biden would have us believe. And I think one of the, you know, we're trying to, hypo, trying to figure out how is it that we're keeping this economy going given all the bad policies. And I think one of the things that's happened is, I'm a baby, I don't know how old you are, I'm a boomer, I'm a baby boomer, I'm 63, I'm getting close to you know, retirement age you know, I, I'm going to start spending down my wealth, and that's what a lot of people, I think, are doing right now. So we're almost at time. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, both of you have said that there are great advantages to uh, the uh, more innovative, uh, more specialized, perhaps, kinds of immigration. Um, so let's talk very briefly, uh, we only have about five minutes left, yeah. about the H-1B visa. Um, do both of you think, uh, so I mean, cl clearly, you know, one of the rote responses that many people give when uh, you know, one points to factories that have closed down in you know, the Rust Belt uh, in Ohio or Pennsylvania or anywhere else is, well, you know, those workers who have been laid off from the auto factory, they can learn to code. 
Uh, but it does seem as if the wages of programmers and other people who uh, you know, would be technological workers are rather depressed by the fact that you do have the H-1B visa, which lets in workers who uh, don't really have the freedom to uh, move between employers, for example. Um, that seems to be a, a privilege and a restriction that uh, you know, is, is advantaging certain companies, perhaps to the disadvantage maybe of the H-1B workers themselves ultimately, but certainly to American workers who would like to compete for those jobs. Well, I, I agree with you. H-1B is a, is a yet another temporary worker program. I don't understand the rationale for it all. Mm -hmm. I think there are certain places within our broader labor market where having visas, I would prefer they not be temporary. Maybe in some cases they could be temporary at the very high end for very specialized skills can make sense. Problem with H-1B visas is that's not who we're actually mm. giving the H-1B visas to. The, H <laughs> the average wage for, for an H-1B visa is moderate to low in, in the spectrum of, of computer programming jobs. And so if we're going to have something like an H-1B visa, the way we should allocate them is by wage. Let the companies who are most desperate and truly cannot find workers and need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the worker you could tell a story why we, we should want to bring that worker in. Creating tens of thousands of dollars of visas for median to below programmers, I can't make any sense of at all. Uh, uh, look, there are some problems with the H-1B visas, as you've talked about, and I don't like the kind of indentured servitude mm -hmm. nature of the program. But come on, I mean, we get, you know, I don't know what the number is right now, maybe a couple hundred thousand really high, highly skilled, technically competent people that fill niches in the... In the, in the economy and keep jobs here, right? To me, it's an economic layup, yeah, definitely. You know, that's not even, these are people who are making well above the average wage in the United States, so they're not depressing wages, they're, they're making American companies a lot more competitive. I mean, look, my issue is, how, as an economist, how do we make sure that the United States remains the dominant, the, you know, the economic dominant country in the world? How we do, do we stay on the commanding height? And I just, I go back to what I said before. I think immigration gives us an advantage. It is, it is one of America's greatest comparative advantages in the competitive world today. All right, gentlemen, I think we are at time. So thank you very much. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Orrin and Steve.